Thanks to, to the organizers and Ilse for the uh, the invitation uh, to be here, and thanks to all of you, and, 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 and good morning. And uh, I'm a relatively uh, guilt-free person, so here are my three conflict of interest down here. I was able to squeeze them onto my uh, uh, title slide. Uh, and, and, and I thank uh, Kelly for the introduction in particular. So really, uh, the take-home point I'd like to leave you with uh, today in thinking about dietary fiber and its interaction with the gut microbiota is that the fiber that we eat uh, it's predominantly not, uh, not only just degraded by the microbiota, that's an easy thing that I, I hope to convince you of, uh, that I will convince you of today, but the amount that we eat also plays a critical role in determining uh, the physiology of gut microbes and their interaction with uh, one of a, the, the critical targets that I hope to leave you with as a, as a potential uh, mediator of the health and disease that goes on in the gut, and that's our interaction with, uh, with, with the mucus layer and, and, and its role in things like enteric inflammation uh, and infection. So uh, I always like to begin with this slide, and if I can use the, can I use the mouse here? Yep. Can you see yes. that over there? So uh, I apologize for the, the, the size on this too, but this is a uh, summary that was made by uh, uh, Bernie Henrizat's lab uh, in, uh, in Marseille, France, that run a database called the Carbohydrate Active Enzyme uh, Database, or CASI for short. Uh, and, and really what I think this slide uh, in the, uh, the, 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 the microbiome here now uh, convinces of, uh, us of very uh, 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 convincingly is that the gut bacteria that inhabit all of us uh, conduct the, virtually all of our uh, complex carbohydrate degradation. So uh, for those of you who are sitting in the front rows on the sides of the room and can see this key down here uh, in the lower left, there's a very small purple circle here scaled to the number 17. That's the number of enzymes, mostly uh, amylases and alpha-glucosidases that are encoded in the human genome and secreted into the GI tract. Uh, for largely degrading uh, for, uh, starch. And these uh, other organisms, we haven't really had a deliberate uh, introduction to the, the microbiome, uh, but the major groups of organisms like the uh, firmicutes, the gram-positive organisms over here, and Bacteroidetes, the two major uh, phyla that are in the human gut, as well as proteobacteria like E. coli, actinobacteria, which is where the bifidos live. Uh, individual genomes that have been sequenced and annotated in this and uh, the circles for each of the species are scaled to the number of enzymes that the genomes encode for complex carbohydrate degradation. We're just showing two of them here, and I'll give you the key up here in the upper left. Uh, GH for glycoside hydrolases and PLs for polysaccharide lyases. And as you can see, some of those circles are huge compared to that 17 that are in the human genome. In fact, some organisms that I'm going to talk about today, uh, Bacteroides ovatus is one of them over here, Bacteroides theta iota, theta iota omicron, or B theta for sure, another one over here have hundreds of enzymes, uh, sometimes three, four hundred or more enzymes for degrading dietary fiber. So orders of magnitude more enzymatic potential towards uh, fiber degradation uh, than the paucity of enzymes uh, for starch degradation that are encoded in the human genome. And what you don't capture in this uh, numerical count, which uh, interestingly sums up to just in this 175 species that are sampled here to around 10,000 total enzymes added on, on, on top of the, the human genomic complement is the diversity of, of linkages. And these enzymes uh, in these species alone, uh, we now know target virtually all of the fiber linkages, all of the pectins, all of the hemicelluloses, in some cases cellulose, uh, beta-glucans, and so forth. Uh, so a remarkable amount of, of, of catalytic diversity encoded by our gut bacteria. And so uh, we also think about this in a uh, in a, a, ge a biogeographical setting, so a lot of the, uh, the fibers that we eat come from sources like dietary plants uh, and dietary animals, uh, uh, the glycosaminoglycans that are uh, also uh, fibers that are contained in animal tissue, uh, albeit to lower levels, and they feed the microbiota, those hundred trillion organisms that exist out here in the lumen of the gut. And really, what I really want to focus on today is this axis between that luminal microbial fermentation uh, and what goes on down here uh, in this layer, which is the mucus layer, which is essentially the endogenous uh, complex carbohydrate that's produced by us, largely to protect ourselves from those organisms that are out there at a density of 10 to the 10th uh, bacteria per, uh, per mil or per gram of, of luminal contents, uh, and our host tissue. Uh, so Joanne mentioned she likes poop. Uh, I love mucus, which is uh, one of my favorite uh, biomolecules. We take lab field trips to go and scrape it out of uh, freshly killed pig rec rectums. Uh, we just did that, did that a few weeks ago. Mucus is, a, is, a, is, a, is an amazing biomolecule. So it's uh, produced and secreted by goblet cells, which are uh, schematized down here uh, in, this, in this tissue schematic. 
A single monomer of the mucus glycoprotein that builds the barrier in the gut is a 1.5 million Dalton molecule uh, composed of about 5,000 amino acids with about 80% carbohydrate added onto it. And if you compare that carbohydrate uh, that's added to mucus, uh, it's made up of monosaccharides like this, five different major monosaccharides, fucose, galactose, uh, two N-acetyl sugars, gluconac and galnac, sialic acid, but in a remarkably diverse uh, scrambling of different linkages. Uh, and part of that's probably meant to act as decoy receptors, part of it's probably meant to confuse the microbiota that could potentially forage on that as a nutrient. If you compare that to starch, which is just glucose and two linkages, uh, it, it, it's a different, uh, different landscape for, for, for uh, uh, degradative bacteria. I also want to introduce a little bit uh, another layer of reality to thinking about fibers. So this is a picture I took last summer and looking at some histology. And this is uh, mouse tissue over here in the bottom left-hand corner. And this is a germ-free mouse with a relatively thin mucus layer. This massive uh, element that's here in the lumen of this, uh, this is a mouse colon, is a piece of fiber that this mouse ate, probably from corn, wheat, soybeans, or oats. Uh, one of the, the four different ingredients that it was feeding upon. And I think this really encapsulates uh, what I call nature's delivery vehicle for fiber. So this is a raw grain, a whole grain, a milled piece of whole grain that this organism ate. And wrapped up in these plant cell walls are some of those fiber molecules in their natural form that are feeding uh, those gut microbes. And this is at least a different perspective, say, than the other end of, the, of, 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 the, of the, the continuum, which would be, say, a prebiotic, where we've extracted those. And we at least expect those to have different influences on uh, on the way they interact with the microbiota, because there's insolubility issues, there's complexity issues associated with this form. Much of our work in the last 12 years has been getting down to really discrete mechanistic uh, associations between uh, the genotypes of, of organisms that are in the gut and the roles that they, uh, that they, that they perform. And uh, you probably really can't see this uh, given the projection, but uh, this uh, top circle up here is, the, is a circular schematic of the genome of Bacteroides theta ida omicron, uh, one of those organisms that had the big circles a few slides ago. Another organism, Bacteroides ovatus, which uh, was an, the, even a bigger circle. And really all I'd like to, to, to leave you with on this slide is that uh, these were two of the first organisms to come out of the, uh, uh, B. ovatus was uh, the, one of the first organisms to come out of the Human Microbiome Project. Uh, B. theta came just prior to the Human Microbiome Project. These were two of the, the, the early organisms from the human gut after E. coli to be sequenced. And their genomes revealed that massive complexity for, uh, for fiber degradation. And what this, the colored circles on this slide summarize is the gene clusters that we've annotated and mapped painstakingly through uh, transcriptomic studies, molecular genetic studies, pure enzyme biochemical studies, and hundreds of enzymes uh, with collaborators, I should say, that have done most of that work to connect those genes with the discrete linkages and dietary fiber that they target. Everything from uh, plant cell wall pectins, and this uh, locus up here is for rhamnogalacteron in two, which just came out in Nature a few months ago. Previously uh, known to thought to be the, the most complex carbohydrate on Earth, 21 different linkages, and B theta and B ovatus will completely uh, saccharify that fiber all the way down to, uh, uh, to down to simple sugars with just the genes that are encoded in, uh, in those enzymes, in, in those locus. So 170 different uh, gene clusters, typically 18 to 20 percent of these bacterial genomes just for fiber degradation. And in just these two organisms, uh, about 2,000 genes or 650 enzymes complementing uh, human digestion. One of the interesting points to, to highlight here is that not every organism, this is just two organisms, does every job in the gut. So B theta if you can see these gold clusters that are uh, the, the, the majority of what's in its genome, or these blue and pink clusters, which are the majority of what's in the B. ovatus genome, are unique gene clusters compared to the other organism. And those are what do a lot of the things, say, in B. ovatus, which are the pink clusters for plant cell wall hemicellulose fiber degradation down here in the, the, the bottom part of this circle. Or B. theta, which is a mucus degrading uh, organism, uh, has the ability to use these oglycan utilization genes. If you can see those uh, annotations up here, it's got many of them to harvest uh, uh, nutrients out of the mucus layer. And that's a trait that B. ovatus lacks. So what I want to focus on is some more emergent animal work that we've been doing to try and take this reductionist perspective and now build back up to an understanding of how do we go from single organisms uh, into uh, communities uh, in animals, and I'm going to only tell you about uh, animal studies, to understand the influence between uh, diet and microbial physiology in the gut and, and, and impacts on health. And this was a study that we published uh, in fall of 2016 from a postdoc in the lab, Mahesh Desai. And he had this hypothesis that if you starve the microbiota from dietary fiber, 
you would push them to disproportionately uh, forage on that mucus layer for nutrients, and that would potentially uh, create uh, an increase in colonization of the mucus layer, uh, or uh, maybe even uh, lead to its erosion. So uh, he used a technology that we use in the field a lot, which is germ-free mice. So these are mice that lack uh, any microbes at all on or in their bodies. We raise them in, uh, in different kinds of isolators in the absence of, of, of microbial growth. And they're essentially a blank palette that you can culture individual microbes. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, 14 different ones uh, across the horizontal axis. Culture those up, mix them into a community, and put them back into that mouse. And if you can do that with cultured organisms, and what, why, the reason why I have this heat map shown here is that those 14 organisms we put in, uh, we can pre-screen them in vitro to ask what their phenotypes are. And the relevant phenotypes I'm showing here on this uh, vertical axis are the abilities of these 14 different organisms to digest uh, uh, complex carbohydrates, many of which are dietary fibers. Uh, so roughly starting, uh, these are all starches and, and, and fructans like inulin. Uh, these are animal tissue glycosaminoglycans, plant cell wall pectins, hemicelluloses, uh, on down the list here. And you can see that some of these organisms uh, on the far left over here, these bacteroides, are very broadly sacrolytic towards uh, those dietary fibers that are in the plant cell wall and other, other places. And uh, I'd like to also call your attention to this top row, which are those O-glycan structures, those highly diversified O-glycan structures that are attached to that, those mucus glycans that make up that protective barrier. And only four of the species in this community, these three bacteroides over here, uh, B. theta, B. K. K. and Barnesiella, and this uh, uh, Verruca microbium over here, Acromancia mucinophila, have the ability to go after mucus as a nutrient source. And this is data for 14 organisms. I didn't, didn't put a, a bigger heat map in, but we have a, a, an even broader set uh, now, hundreds of, 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 of organisms screened like this. And there seems to be some general dichotomy between organisms that go after uh, dietary fiber as a, as a nutrient source versus the ones that go after mucus. So that we, can, we can tip this balance between uh, fiber degradation and mucus degradation, perhaps simply by feeding. So when uh, Mahesh assembled these into germ-free mice, uh, we uh, assembled the community into germ-free mice that are all fed a, a fiber-rich diet. This is the same diet that I showed you, that piece uh, of fiber in the mouse colon a few slides ago. Uh, about 15% uh, dietary fiber derived from uh, whole corn, wheat, uh, soybean meal, and, and oats. You can see a very stable colonization for a 54-day experiment that, uh, where the diet's unchanged. Lots of Biovatus here in yellow, lots of Eubacterium rectali, a known fiber degrader here in blue, uh, in red, Marvin Bryantia, and so forth. These are those fiber degrading organisms at a certain carrying state in this community because they're getting fed, uh, they're, they're metabolizing that dietary fiber. And just, I'm showing you one of the treatments here on the right. At the end of this black bar at day 14, Mahesh took away that high fiber diet in this treatment group and gave them a fiber-free diet. And fiber-free is actually not the right term for this diet. It actually has 8% cellulose in it, but none of these organisms can use that cellulose so it's uh, deficient in fiber that, these, that, that any of these members can actually uh, metabolize. And after that treatment, you can see there's a uh, remarkable and, and rapid shift in the community structure. Uh, within a day or two, uh, the community uh, uh, reassorts itself, uh, reconfigures to show a lot of this pink, purple organism here, Bacteroides KK. That was one of the four mucus degraders, and about a doubling in the population of this, uh, this other red arrow is pointing to a, the Acromancia mucinophila, uh, as its name implies, that a mucin-loving organism that's also a mucus degrader. So the first piece of evidence that shifting diet, removing dietary fiber, is actually pushing the community towards, uh, towards mucus degradation. I won't spend a lot of time here, but this is just a little bit of enzymology going into the transcriptomes of these organisms at the end of, uh, of this community. So at the end of the high fiber uh, group that I, I showed you on the, the left of the last slide versus the, the, the low fiber treatment, if you look at the ratio, uh, which is the y-axis here, of gene expression in the, com the, the communities from mice that were fed the fiber-rich diet relative to the fiber-free diet, uh, everything that goes up here on the y-axis is more highly expressed towards the fiber-deprived condition. So in other words, of the uh, 1,661 different carbohydrate active enzymes that were encoded just in these 14 species alone, and almost 50% of those showed activity in this, in this diet treatment. Uh, all these ones that are going up here and uh, expressed by enzymes like, uh, by organisms like Bacteroides ovatus in yellow and Eubacterium rectali in blue are expressed by those organisms toward, to, to degrade that dietary fiber. So that's the microbial fiber response. And this sliver over here on the, on, on the far right 
is the opposite response. Those are going down because, and you can see the colors change, because those are enzymes that are being expressed by organisms like Bacteroides KK and Acromantia mucinophila to digest mucus. And those are known mucus degrading casein families like Sialidases uh, and N-acetylgalactosaminidases, uh, et cetera, for removing those linkages from sugar. So a bit of a, of a mechanistic uh, 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 nitty gritty uh, uh, look at, at, at what's actually going on. The really striking data comes when you look at the colons of these mice at the endpoint of the experiment. So fix them uh, and uh, do the histology to look at the, uh, the mucus layer. And in the upper left here are two different ways of looking at that. So these are, this is uh, an alcyon blue stain for mucus. This is host tissue over here. This is the lumen with all the fiber from this fiber rich diet. And this blue layer right here is about a hundred micron thick mucus layer. And that's the typical uh, thickness in a mouse colon. This is a little bit easier to see down here. This is stained with uh, an anti muc 2 antibody, which is the dominant mucin in the, in, in the mouse colon as well as the human colon. And in the, the treatment on that left, which is the fiber rich group where those um, uh, fiber degrading organisms were dominant, there's a nice thick mucus layer. If you contrast that over here to uh, mice that were fed that fiber deficient diet, uh, and this is the quantification over here in uh, green to uh, red, that mucus layer was noticeably thinned down just from that diet-induced uh, uh, microbiota behavior, pushing them more towards uh, eroding the mucus layer. Uh, and these are a number of, uh, of other treatment groups over here, but the, the, the really key one here is uh, high fiber versus low fiber diet. We did try to make a prebiotic intervention. Uh, we called it a prebiotic intervention. This is soluble fibers that were added back to the diet. I won't draw too many conclusions from this because this was one chemical formulation and one dosage, 2% by weight of the diet. But at least at that formulation, uh, it did nothing to improve the situation uh, with respect to mucus erosion. So a lot of space to explore there. Uh, with respect to uh, imp improving uh, uh, mucus thickness through, uh, through supplementation. These are just some markers that show that the host wasn't making less mucus uh, and that there was a slight response in, in some of the inflammatory markers that, that suggested that uh, this fiber deficient thin mucus condition uh, was provoking uh, some sort of a homeostatic response by the host. But Really, the take-home point was that these mice were not sick. We were expecting them maybe to get colitic, maybe to get inflamed, maybe to be sick, but they were some of the fattest, happiest, healthiest mice uh, without a mucus layer uh, that we've ever raised. Some of them got over 50 grams. And so we went to the drawing boards and we uh, made some new hypotheses and we asked, if one group of mice has a thick mucus layer, one has a thin mucus layer, uh, what happens if we bring another uh, uh, confounding factor, another trigger into the situation? And we went, in this case, to a pathogen uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with this, pathogen Citrobacter rodentium is a, is a murine pathogen that's extremely similar to enteropathogenic and enter, enterohemorrhagic E. coli uh, enteric infections that, that, that humans get uh, uh, in the third world as well as uh, outbreaks uh, in, in the developed world. Its niche is to live at the epithelial layer, so it needs to get through the mucus in the colon in order to get to uh, its preferred uh, docking site, which is uh, close contact with epithelial cells, and we reasoned that in a low fiber, thin mucus, dietary-induced uh, 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 state, the, uh, the low-fiber uh, mice would be more susceptible to that pathogen. And that uh, indeed turns out to be true. Uh, so this is pathogen burden in this graph on the upper, uh, upper left. The green curve is the pathogen burden in high-fiber uh, mice versus uh, mice with the exact same microbiota those same 14 species on a low fiber diet, and you can see that the pathogen uh, explodes in, in abundance much more rapidly, uh, achieving significance. And those mice in the, in, in the red curve that were uh, fed that low fiber diet had a thin mucus layer and experienced that pathogen. Uh, this is their uh, weight loss curve and their lethality curve over here. Actually lose so much weight as a result of that increased pathogen burden that they, uh, that they, they, uh, they need to be euthanized or they, they, they die from it. When you look at the histology, this is uh, this red uh, bar in the middle is the, the amount of hyperplasia over surface area in the colon. Uh, I'm showing cecum here, uh, the proximal colon uh, in the mouse. Uh, the histology reflected uh, that a larger surface area was being uh, influenced by the pathogen, which suggested that because of that uh, microbiota-induced mucus erosion, the pathogen, when it comes in, was just getting access to more surface area in the gut. The barrier was down over, uh, over uh, a larger region of the gut, and this is essentially all hyperplastic tissue, uh, uh, disease tissue in fiber-free fed mice. This is all healthy tissue uh, in fiber-rich fed mice. And one way to test that uh, is to 
infect uh, mice that were experiencing either the uh, high fiber condition here on the left versus the low fiber condition with the luminescent citrobacter pathogen. And these are colons from proximal to distal, where we've opened them up after, uh, four days after infection, taken all the luminal contents out, and just ask, where are the luminescent bacteria, which is the color that you see there uh, in those images, uh, on the, the epithelial surface. And you can see that the mice that started the infection over here on the right with a much thinner mucus layer because the microbiota in a diet-induced fashion was, was eroding it, uh, have much higher pathogen burdens, particularly here in the rectum and in the transverse colon. So more support for the conclusion that uh, diet is driving the microbiota to erode the mucus layer uh, and increase pathogen susceptibility. What was most striking about those results, and, and this on the top here now, I'm showing you some old data from uh, another lab. This was published back in 2010 from Bruce Valence's lab was, oh, and this is the same pathogen, by the way, this is Citrobacter uh, infection. But these are wild-type uh, mice versus a genetic mutant mouse, where they went in and genetically ablated the ability of the mouse to even make a mucus layer. Uh, there's no mutation in, in humans, uh, IBD or otherwise, that, that are this severe. This is uh, a very severe thing to do to do a mouse GI tract. What's remarkable is that the kinetics of lethality shown here for these uh, MUC2 knockout mice was almost identical, uh, this is a weight loss, uh, two hour, diet-induced mice, and lethality is just a little bit uh, accelerated. So to interpret that a different way, we essentially phenocopied with 14 species that most of us are walking around with in a wild-type mouse and just a low-fiber diet, the same phenomenon, the same effect of genetically ablating the ability to make that mucus layer, uh, which, was, uh, which is pretty, pretty stunning similarity between those, between those two effects. And we further thought that MUC2 mice are known to rapidly get intestinal inflammation and eventually after several months will progress to, to colorectal cancer compared to wild type mice. So we, we started thinking about removing the pathogen from this equation uh, of diet induced mucus erosion and thinking about chronic diseases like inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancer. So uh, this is some unpublished data where we've taken, uh, completely taken that pathogen, Citrobacter, out of the equation. We're still keeping the same 14 commensal species that were uh, originally present, uh, 14 species that, that, that most of us have, many of us have in our GI tract. And we're uh, replacing that pathogen essentially with another uh, mutation in the, in the host animal. In this case, this is uh, interleukin-10 deficiency, which is one of the common uh, inflammatory bowel disease risk markers that are present in humans. And if you look at the right over here, the two treatment groups, or two different biological replicates uh, in green, are IL-10 mice colonized with those 14 species fed a high fiber diet, same one that we used in the, in the previous experiments, versus switched to day 14 uh, in the red curves on that low fiber diet. And you can see that for about uh, 20 or 25 days after that diet switch, the two curves, the four, the four curves, the two treatments basically maintain the same kinds of trajectory, uh, trajectories. And then right around day uh, 32 to 35, they diverge. And the mice that were uh, colonized with that, with that community, presumably uh, having their microbiota push to erode the mucus layer, uh, begin to uh, diverge and lose weight. Uh, remarkable weight loss uh, towards the end of the curve. This is just the endpoint weight loss uh, summarized over here. Uh, and have to be killed and have to be euthanized. So uh, diet-driven, uh, inflammatory bowel disease susceptibility uh, marker-driven uh, uh, disease outcome uh, in the complete absence of pathogen. These are just the controls with germ-free mice over here, showing that if we take the, the microbial community out and still use that diet treatment in the context of IL-10, uh, the, the disease is spared. And I've got one more slide. This is just uh, inflammatory marker, but the really striking uh, uh, data for, uh, for colitis evidence is when you look at the histology in these organisms. So this is the cecum of those colonized uh, low fiber mice with an IL-10 deficiency versus on high fiber. This is all normal, healthy uh, uh, cecal epithelial tissue. This is a massive ulcer, uh, which is characteristic of the, of the histology. These are the same exact magnifications in these mice. So this is extremely severe diet microbiota driven, low fiber diet microbiota driven disease uh, uh, that we're recreating in these animals. And it raises the, the opportunity now to go into that low fiber diet and ask what doses, what kinds, what chemistries of fibers. And we think a lot about the nitty gritty chemistry of the pectins, the hemicelluloses, and everything else that we can put in there in various amounts to bring this system back to, uh, back to homeostasis and uh, uh, coax the microbiota away from, uh, from mucus erosion. And uh, just to, to end up with a couple of bullet points, uh, we know that gut bacteria perform uh, most of our fiber degradation. Uh, that's been known for a long time, and we've been working to get more mechanistic uh, in understanding the hundreds of species of, of gut microbes uh, that are out there. 
There's this interesting inverse correlation between uh, luminal fiber degradation and mucus erosion. So in a nutshell, if we don't feed our gut microbiota enough fiber from outside, uh, they'll get their nutrients some uh, another way, and that's by chewing uh, on us, on our mucus layer. And we can inflict the, that damage to our community just by, by withholding uh, dietary fiber. And, I uh, showed you data for pathogen susceptibility, and uh, we're uh, equally excited about this data, but for chronic diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, and uh, gives us opportunities now to jump towards human studies with, uh, uh, easier to human studies with uh, fiber interventions. And uh, I'll end by thanking everybody uh, who's funded the work and, and collaborated on the work over the years, and uh, I won't name everybody, but uh, there's many of them, so. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Thank Eric. you. Thank you. Question? some of the potential confounders or mechanisms that you're looking at here. In one respect, the uh, mucus is not necessarily mucus the same way all the time. I mean, it varies greatly by inflammation, hormonal conditions, et cetera, and stuff. So uh, just one consideration that, that might be uh, useful here, although uh, it's an extremely uh, well taken consideration, and, and it, it, even the kinetics in that in that IL-10 weight loss curve, I think, are very interesting. Because uh, if I won't go through it in, in a lot of detail, because I think we're short on time, but if you consider how fast that community shifts towards mucus degradation and how long it takes for for disease to develop, there's probably a lot going on there in terms of the host trying to compensate for. Uh, making more mucus, different qualities of mucus, and finally, I think the system just breaks down, a uh, hypothesis that the system just breaks down, and, and we're exploring second, all those options about quality. Sorry, and, yep. uh, and the second is that the mucus actually provides an anchor for a number of the uh, lycobacillus or some other species like that, and that may be uh, part of the reason why that uh, kind of protection breaks down, is that you're losing some uh, uh, lycobacillus type species that may be helpful in reducing the pathogenicity as well, too. Uh, Exactly. Also a good point. David. David Clark, I'm at the Agricultural Research Service. Beautiful talk, Eric. Um, you showed a, a bar graph with the species specialization of the various carbohydrate degrading enzymes. Um, related to that, though, um, I've seen citations of up to 40 to 50 percent horizontal genetic transfer among intestinal bacteria. Do we know anything about the ability of these digestive enzymes to move from one species to another? Uh, we do, and that, that would be a whole other presentation, but I, I think 30 or 40% is probably, or 40, 50%, whatever, is probably too high. But uh, lateral gene transfer is, is rampant among these organisms, and a lot of it's uh, uh, orthologous or non orthologous replacement of functions. Uh, so when we look at groups of related species, we see the same, the same general trends towards. Uh, towards polysaccharide degradation, uh, but there's also well-studied examples like the Japanese uh, porphyrin sushi factor that jumped in on mobile elements, and we, we, we see uh, lots of cases of that, not just for porphyrin, but for agarose, for carrageenan, for uh, fungal cell walls, and so. The Lee of the University of Alberta in Edmonton. A really beautiful talk, and I was really intrigued with the dichotomy that between the fiber and an organism and a degrading organism. So when you did the last experiment in the IL-10 knockouts with the fiber deficient diet, did you see that shift towards the more pathobiontic organism or was it you only work with those species, that's what you put in the model? Uh, we've only worked with the same 14 species and so we haven't actually gotten the data back on those IL-10 communities to, to, to prove that they shifted the exact same way. Uh, we're uh, assuming that they did but it's not not confirmed yet. I think that data is waiting for me when I get back next week. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, I have a, well, it's, so it was interesting to know how the microbiota shifts from using degrading them to a normal type of fiber degrading microorganisms. I was wondering, in case of fasting, which recently has been reported that uh, physiological benefits in human, do you think the legacy degraders will also increase when we fast? I think it's a great question. So the question was about fasting and how does that, uh, I, I would, without any, any experimental evidence to back it up, I would, uh, I, 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 would, I would predict that you would see a change like this. Whether or not that change is, does any damage is probably uh, dependent on the other context and triggers. I mean, if you were fasting for, for multiple days or, or going to McDonald's for multiple days and not getting enough fiber in and you encountered a pathogen, uh, that might alter the outcome of that, of that 
uh, interaction, depending on how much of a dose of a pathogen you got. Uh, maybe you don't want to fast if you've got a, an IL-10 predis uh, or a IBD predisposition. But thanks, there. Thank you. Thank you.